Psalm 127. We're going to um, pause our series on a worldview until next week. And I want to deal with another topic this morning, related. And I need to ask your indulgence a little bit, those of you who do not have children, because we're going to be dealing with the topics of parenting and children this morning. And I would say to you that maybe you are older, maybe you don't have children. Well, maybe you have grandchildren. These principles apply to you. Uh, Maybe you don't have children or grandchildren, but you know what? You're in a church, which means that you can help be an example of these things and encourage our young families in this direction as well. And so there is application here for everybody, and there is some truth uh, to the reality that it takes a community, a church community, to be an encouragement and a blessing to others as we seek to raise up a generation of kids um, for the Lord. And so there is application here to everybody. So don't tune me out, even though you may feel that you're not personally um, being reached with the topic this morning. Psalm 127, verse 1 through 5. We're going to start there. This is largely going to be a topical message, and we're going to come back to Psalm 127 at the conclusion. So Psalm 127 and Deuteronomy 6 are going to be our main passages and going to be largely topical. Psalm 127, verse 1 says that this is a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with the enemies in the gate. This psalm, as mentioned, is a psalm or a song of ascents. This is a song that would have been sung uh, by a Jewish family as they were uh, on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so in that sense, this is kind of like a confession of the family. You could picture a mom and a dad and children together singing this and uh and they too, uh, together are confessing this as really family truth. Uh, we as a family are committed uh, to the content of this psalm. And it says there in verse 3 that children are a heritage from the Lord. Oh, what does that mean? A heritage or a legacy which you're able to leave to the world, which you're able to leave the world long after your passing. Children are God's provision for you to take your faith and to, uh, long after you're deceased, uh, to pass it on, maybe not just in the next generation, but the generation after that and after that. And so you have a tremendous responsibility and opportunity, parents, uh, because you can kind of launch off into the culture, uh, eventually a whole host of people uh, that you have passed your value system onto. Not only this, but through our children, we you know, it's not just one generation, but we can multiply them. So look at verse 4. It says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children of one's youth. And it says uh, that the man who has his quiver full of them is blessed. This is the priority um, and really shows us how we have to view our children. A gift, a heritage, a blessing, and we are blessed when we have many of them. Obviously, that was uh, the mentality of my wife and I uh, when we were producing children. Uh, We really should value the ability to leave a legacy, and we will value that if we desire to impact the world long after our passing. And so children are a blessing from God. Now, notice again in verse 4, the comparison is to arrows. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children of one's youth. And so the comparison is that of an archer who has a quiver full of arrows, and those arrows are ready for battle. These arrows very likely are fashioned by the archer himself. And so what do you need in an arrow? Well, it needs to be straight and strong and sharp in order to be prepared uh, for battle. He then would take his arrows when they were ready and launch them when the time was right. And it's a wonderful picture of family life. And so you spend your time fashioning your children. uh, You're helping them grow up. Uh, strong and sharp and knowledgeable. Their faith is strong. They're able to engage the world. And the time comes where you got to launch them. But w- what are you doing when you launch them? You're launching them into battle is what you're doing. And we've talked much in the last weeks about the reality that we exist in the midst of a spiritual battle. 
our children are a generation that we are to train up so that they will be equipped to engage in the spiritual battle. They are to be so molded that they will have an impact in the world, especially where the spiritual battle is concerned. Unfortunately, many parents don't view their children that way, and you've witnessed this. They don't view their children as a reward from God, but an inconvenience or a distraction or a hindrance. Many homes, instead of having deliberate instruction and deliberate relationship for the purpose of preparing a generation, almost seems like you have parents and children alike who are just managing to get through the day together. Many homes are devoid of any deliberate instruction or consistent correction or personal example or loving affection, which is wrong. So with these messed up priorities and misunderstood responsibilities, Christian homes are churning out children who are ill-equipped to function in the world. They can't function in the world as vibrant, settled, resolute believers who are ready to engage in spiritual battle. Instead, they're producing weak and worldly kids who know only a diluted faith that barely approaches a weak moralism. That's wrong. We as believers have been gifted by God with children for a purpose, to mold and shape and prepare them to engage in spiritual battle. So many of us are producing arrows that are crooked and splintered and dull and unable to fly, let alone pierce the armor of the enemy. You say, well, how can we raise godly kids in such a generation? This world is ungodly. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the wickedness of the culture is pressing in, and it's pressing in harder and harder as time goes on. Well, think about this. God has left us. His children, in the midst of a godless culture. In Philippians 2.14, it says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. God's priority is to leave His children in the midst of this world until the coming of Christ. That's what He's done for us. What is he? He's left us here, but He's prepared us and equipped us to be able to overcome the world. We then are to do the same thing with our children. And so there's twin uh, imbalances. One imbalance is to say, well, I'm going to inoculate my children to the world by exposing them to the world. Wrong. The other one is, uh, I'm going to protect my children from the world by sheltering them from the world. Wrong. We are to allow our children to understand the culture, to be able to witness the wickedness of the culture to a certain degree so that they can understand where the culture is going. They need to be far more saturated with the Scriptures in a biblical worldview than the culture, uh, so they can see the contrast and they can expose the wickedness of the culture. Uh, But we don't try to out-parent God by sheltering our children to the point where they don't know how to engage the culture, because that's not what He's done with us. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, said, I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, which is good advice. Don't associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Don't associate with sexually immoral people. What Paul is saying, though, is uh, what I meant was those who call themselves Christians who identify this way. But you can't avoid sexually immoral people and swindlers and idolaters because they're all around you in the world, and otherwise you'd have to go out of the world. Really what he's saying is we're not about... uh, you know, being secluded away in a monastery. We're not about asceticism. We're not about uh, extreme separation. You are going to be in the world. You're just not to be of the world. Now, some who love sin and love the world will use such a teaching to say, well, see, uh, it's fine for me to hang out with so-and-so and and -and so-and-so. No. And oftentimes people look at Jesus and say, well, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and sinners and so on. Yeah, but they didn't remain prostitutes and sinners when Jesus was done with them. This is the reality in which God has left us. He's left us to remain in a perverse, godless world. And we, again, should not imagine that we're going to out-parent God by sheltering our children from it. But that does not mean exposing them to it uh, without corrective instruction. This is where God has chosen to place us. Our job as parents is to not to create some artificial bubble for our kids, keeping them forever ignorant of the sinful world around them. Instead, we are to raise them in the midst of it, teaching them and guiding them in how to answer such wickedness with faith and reliance upon God. And so your dinner table ought to, at some time, just involve conversation with your children about what's in the headlines. 
You ought to be able then to have conversations with your kids about, yes, did you see what's happening here? Did you hear what so-and-so said? And then to apply a biblical worldview so that you're equipping them with a lens through which to interpret what's going on in the world. Understand, parents, by doing nothing, your children become worldlings. By doing nothing, your children become worldlings. That's just a matter of fact of life in this world. And so we must be proactive in helping them to interpret the world through a biblical worldview. Unfortunately, many are woefully ill-equipped to do so, but it shouldn't be that way. Even Jesus in John 17, 15, praying to the Father, said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And that's our priority as parents, uh, not to take them out through overboard sheltering, but to equip them uh, to endure and to not succumb to the evil one. Now, that being said as introduction, I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we'll we'll see in Deuteronomy chapter 6 some principles, and then we'll add some others. Just as Psalm 127 was a song of ascents that would be sung by a family as they approached Jerusalem, kind of a family confession, so Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, is what we call the Shema. And this was a Jewish prayer that would be repeated twice twice a day. So again, uh, Parents and children alike would be repeating these words. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And I just say as an aside, isn't it interesting that in Psalm 127, Deuteronomy 6, you're seeing instruction about raising kids and priorities and raising kids. And within the Jewish culture, you would have the kids repeating these things. That means the children themselves are being exposed to biblical principles on parenting. What a great approach, because then they understand why mom and dad have the priorities they do. They understand why mom and dad are parenting the way they do. Because they themselves are familiar with a biblical pattern for parenting. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is really the confession of faith in Israel. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, your entire family life ought to be saturated with this teaching. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And so, first of all, we see that we must, raising our kids for the glory of the Lord, we are to provide our children with diligent instruction. That's verse 7. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Look for every opportunity you you have or you can find in the flow of daily life. Now, listen, you may be doing a good job when it comes to Uh, Maybe you you have a catechism, maybe you have a devotional time with your children and so on, and those are wonderful things. Um, But this is not about compartmentalizing spirituality. This is not about having a time together as a family where maybe you pray, maybe you do a devotion, and uh, then that's all the spirituality that enters into your home life. The pattern here is that of a saturation. This is, this is a characteristic of every aspect of our home life. We are constantly talking about spiritual things. We are constantly talking about biblical priorities. We are constantly talking about uh, a love for the Lord. Um, protect against compartmentalizing spirituality in your home life. This is to be deliberate instruction. Teach them diligently to your children. That is, this is effort. Uh, this You have an agenda. You have a goal in mind here. This doesn't happen by accident. And warning again, uh, don't assume that because you bring your children to church, uh, that they are going to automatically assume for themselves a biblical worldview and be prepared to enter the world. That's not the priority here. The priority here is parents, fathers, you teach, mothers. This is in the home. That's the primary avenue of discipleship. And so it saturates day-to-day activities of life. Everything and every time is an opportunity to teach. You should be able to get into spiritual conversation with your children at the drop of a hat uh, at any time in your home. If we talk about the Great Commission, going and preaching the gospel and teaching all nations and so on, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, 
uh, we need to apply that to home life as well. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Apostle Paul is encouraging Timothy. And he says to Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Again, applied to the church, but even applied to the home as well. In fact, the very context in which the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy about the sufficiency of Scripture, he says in 2 Timothy 3, 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy, remember what you were taught as a child. And so much of the teaching that Paul would offer to Timothy, the foundation was already laid, and he could just appeal to the foundation that was laid by his mother and grandmother. And so in 2 Timothy 1.4, Paul says to Timothy, I remember your tears. I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. What a wonderful encouragement for those who have uh, an, a less than ideal uh, structure in your home life. And you say, well, we don't have a mother and a father and children, the traditional nuclear family. Uh, well, that's okay. You know what Timothy had? Timothy had mom and grandma. Mom and grandma. And so our task is to understand that the Word of God is sufficient. And as parents, do not feel guilty about this. We are being taught in our culture that it is wrong for parents to impose their belief system upon their children. And there's a movement of kind of like um, the autonomy of children so that children have rights outside of their parents and they can appeal to some organization for those rights, even against their parents. And that's happening in certain areas, especially when it comes to gender uh, confusion and things like this. And so we're being taught that it's, uh, you know, you just let your children grow up in your home and then just let them decide uh, at some point in the future. No. But we're being told this by a culture that has no problem from preschool on up through the university years of indoctrinating our children with their ideologies and their worldview, at the same time trying to make parents feel guilty for imposing their beliefs upon their children. Uh, no, your children will be indoctrinated, uh, whether it be in your home or whether it be in the school system or by the culture. And so we don't feel bad about understanding the Scripture, processing it ourselves, principalizing it ourselves, applying it ourselves, and then teaching it to our children and passing it on to them as we process the Word of God. And so uh, there's no qualms about you passing the faith on to your children. This is what you should believe. This is what truth is. This is how you come to salvation. This is what morality looks like. Teach that to your children as truth. As they get older, they may adopt that faith as their own. They may receive Christ and so on. They may not. Your responsibility, my responsibility as a parent, however, is to teach it as truth and to pass that on to them. The Word of God is sufficient to this task, to instruct our children all that God wants them to know. And the Word of God can penetrate hearts. And so again, protection against moralism and uh, just um, maybe the studious application of truth. Uh, it's great to have a worldview, but ultimately the Scriptures themselves are what penetrate the Holy Spirit imparting the truth of the Word into the hearts of our children. So if we desire our children to live for the glory of God, to love Him with all of our their hearts and souls and might, mind, we need to trust that the Word of God is sufficient and give them diligent instruction. Next of all, we must provide our children with personal illustration. Personal illustration. Look back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Notice before verse 7, verse 7 says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. Verse 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Parents trying to teach their children biblical principles or biblical truth who they themselves uh, are not living is absolutely disastrous, potentially disastrous. Now, God in His grace may be able to take the truth that's being taught by hypocrites and actually impart it to the hearts of children. Uh, on the other hand, it's very likely that children watching their parents as hypocrites uh, will eventually renounce the faith. And so the priority here is 
Get it in your heart. First, sincere, heartfelt, genuine relationship with the Lord, a desire to serve Him with your whole heart. Allow your children to see that and then pass it on with credibility. That's personal example. We have education in the Word of God. We have experience with the God of the Word. I'm going to read you a sad passage in Judges chapter 2. You don't have to turn there, but just listen. And then I'm going to read to you Psalm 78. Judges 2, verse 6. This is a sad uh, occasion where the faith was not passed on from one generation to the next. Judges 2, 6 says, When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him with the boundaries, within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Hires, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And verse 10 says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. Here we have a situation where a generation had witnessed the miracles of the Lord. And this obviously had an incredible impact upon that generation so that they served the Lord faithfully. But what happened? One generation died off, another generation died off, another generation rose up who didn't know the Lord. And so they rebelled. There's a failure. There's a breakdown here, isn't there? It's not enough. And, and I say this to, to you parents maybe who come from an unbelieving background. Maybe your parents were not believers. And you came to the Lord and you had a dramatic conversion experience. You came to embrace a faith that your parents didn't embrace. And that was remarkable. That was life-changing. That was transformative in your life, obviously. And, and so then you set out to, to uh, raise up a generation that loves the Lord with all their hearts and soul and mind and strength. And you've done a, a good job in that for the most part. But you understand that the generations coming cannot forever live off of uh, kind of the afterglow of your conversion experience. We must diligently pass on the instruction of the Word of God. Not just knowledge of the Scripture, but try to pass on a love for the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If we think that the power of our personal conversion experience is going to last one generation, two generations, and three generations, we're sadly mistaken. That's not how it works. We must diligently instruct from one generation to the next. Psalm 78, in contrast to Judges 2, it says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. In other words, that was the fathers before. Uh, this is us, and we are determined. Pass it on, but not only pass it on, but pass it on in such a way where our children know that they must pass it on so that every generation has a fresh personal love for the Lord. It must begin with diligent instruction, but that diligent instruction must be offered in the vehicle of somebody who genuinely loves the Lord. Personal illustration. Number three, we must provide cons or consistent correction. Consistent correction. And my observation is that even those who might teach well and might even have a sincere faith themselves, fail when it comes to discipline or correction. I see uh, some godly families, families that I might say, this is a godly family, God is in the center of their family, but their children are unruly. 
because there's no correction or there's no discipline. This itself is irresponsible and I think disobedience. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, uh, this is uh, David speaking of his nature. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me, did conceive me. Th this is kind of what we understand about human nature, right? That we are all born sinners. Romans 5.2 says that sin was passed upon all of mankind. We understand this. Proverbs 22.15 is a little bit more direct. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. And just to be on the record, since we're on video, I'm not advocating using an object to discipline your children physically. That's not the point here. The point here is that there must be a culture, an environment in the home where a child understands there will be correction and there will be discipline for disobedience. We understand that we all by nature gravitate towards sinfulness. You know that as an adult, as you struggle sometimes in obedience to Christ. Uh, so much more so a child. This child is born continually gravitating towards the sensual passions and sinfulness of his nature. Uh, and again, just as the culture presses in upon our homes, if we do nothing, children left to themselves bring shame upon themselves and to their families. This is just human nature. We recognize that. So then we must be proactive. Proverbs 19.18 says, Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. <laughs> that is, don't, uh, don't worry about the fact, you know, some parents are so concerned that I can't discipline my child or I can't correct my child um, because I love them too much. <laughs> yeah, you've heard this before. Um, Proverbs 29, 17, discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. I said earlier that we should not try to outparent God by thinking we should shelter our children to the point where they don't know what's going on in the culture, which means they're so ill-equipped that they'll never know how to apply a biblical worldview. So too, we don't try to outparent God by holding discipline or correction from our children. Because what does the Bible say about God? He disciplines those that he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Proverbs 13, 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. What does that look like? Well, that looks like different things at different ages, doesn't it? Uh, and so in their very, very young age, uh, versus all the way up into the teenage years, uh, that's going to change over time. And wisdom says, I'm going to apply uh, appropriate discipline and correction to my child based upon their stage of development. But that is the responsibility of a parent, consistent correction. We cannot leave our children to the culture. We cannot even leave our children to themselves when it comes to discipline. We are molding and shaping. So again, the picture of the arrows. How do you shape an arrow? Well, you, you take a, a branch and maybe it's got uh, some lumps in it, and maybe it's got the bark still on it and so on, and you take a knife to that thing and you got to uh, shave that off and you got to smooth it over and so on. And that may not be, as far as the branch is concerned, that's not an enjoyable process. But you know what you're doing. You have a master plan in mind. You know what the end result ought to be. And so you take care of that, uh, that branch and at the end of the day when you're all done, it's fit for a purpose. That is our responsibility as parents. And so we must offer consistent correction. One of the failures of parents with young children is they offer correction, but it's not consistent. Children will always push to whatever boundary or whatever limit they understand gets them what they want. And so if screaming for one minute gets me what I want, I'll scream for one minute. If screaming for three minutes gets what I want, then I'm going to scream for three minutes. And understand that children, young children, uh, they are determined. And they are determined that they're going to win the battle. And so they understand that if I do this uh, for a certain amount of time and it wears down my mother and she finally gives in to me, then that's just what I'm going to have to do, <laughs> right? And, uh, and you know that. And so as parents, we must be consistent, consistently applied guidelines and rules. Uh, we understand that as parents, that when we choose to discipline, we are always going to win that battle. We never allow our children uh, in engaging us in disobedience to win that battle. We always win. Uh, and so sometimes that takes inconvenience. Sometimes that takes uh, a lot of work. Um, but the reality is our children need to understand that mom and dad are authority. 
we must uh, endow them with a respect for authority. Exodus 20, 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Listen, mom and dad. It is not your purview to decide whether or not you are going to um, tolerate dishonorable, dishonorable behavior from your children. And you say, well, my children dishonor me or they disobey me, um, and you don't correct that. Um, well, you're disobedient, mom, dad. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother. You're training up a rebel. You're disobeying God. It's not about whether or not you are demanding the honor. You must train your children to honor father and mother because the Lord has told you to train your children to honor father and mother. So it's not about you. It's about what the Lord wants for your children. And so you demand honor. You expect obedience. Why? Because this is God's pattern for child rearing. So honor your father and your mother. Let your days may be long in the land. Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Uh, we take too much liberty to ourselves as parents when we allow our children to utter disrespectful or disobedient uh, things towards us. Um, you're really abdicating your biblical responsibility. Children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. And keep that in mind, parents, mom and dad. When you allow your children to get away with disobedience or dishonoring behavior, you yourself are being disobedient and dishonoring to your heavenly Father. And so we must give our children consistent correction. Understand that as you're correcting your children, you're, you're not their peer, right? You understand that your 12-year-old child who wants to argue with you is not your peer, which means you don't come down to their level and start arguing with them. You don't become sarcastic with them. You don't do that with your 14-year-old or your 15-year-old or your 16-year-old or your 17-year-old. Uh, you are a parent. Understand that the office that you hold is God-given. You discipline and you correct and you instruct and you parent holding an office that is patterned by God. It means you do not, again, have the luxury to parent however you wish and say, well, I just want to be my child's friend. No, you be friendly with your child, but that's not your responsibility. That's your responsibility as they enter into adulthood but not when they're a child under your roof. And so don't abdicate your responsibility. Don't come down to your child's level as if you're a peer and you're going to argue with them or be sarcastic with them. That's wrong. You expect honor. You expect obedience. If not for your own sake personally, for the sake of the office that you hold that is designed by God. And so we give our children consistent correction. Number four... We must provide our children with diligent protection. Diligent protection. I said above that we, earlier, that we are left here in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. God's done that. This does not mean, however, that we simply leave our children vulnerable to the ungodly, sinful influences of the world. That's not what God has done for us. He has actually equipped us to meet those influences. And so in the context of Philippians chapter 2 that I read earlier, it says in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And then he goes on to talk about being in a blameless and innocent, or being blameless and innocent in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. In other words, God is in us and he is working in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure while we engage in the wickedness of the culture, engage the wickedness of the culture. So God has equipped us. He's left us here, but he's also left us with all the means to remain holy while we are here. The goal is what? Children who are blameless, innocent, without blemish. Clearly the children of God in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So as parents, we're to model Christian lives. We're to live lives which utilize God's means to overcome the world. We must use God's means and apply them to the lives of our children. We must not retreat from the world, but train up our children to persevere for the purpose of reaching the world. Again, John 17, 15, Jesus said, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. 
as we've been talking about a worldview, informing a biblical worldview, we must form a biblical worldview, pass it on to our children, but it must go beyond moralism, but it must be moral. It's an authoritative morality, which is rooted in the unchanging holy character of God, not the shifting sands of societal values. And just as a warning, parents, a little bit of practical uh, advice, much of what's happened with the technological revolutions of the last few decades is that uh, we have, as parents, utterly failed when it comes to applying proper biblical parenting into the realm of digital technology. And so we've allowed the, uh, the rise of digital technology really to become the domain of our children. And so you don't even know what the latest social apps are, or you don't have it. Like I gave up a long time ago. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know nothing of TikTok. I mean, I stopped at Snapchat. I don't, I don't, I don't even know if I'm using the right terms here. Uh, you know, and so that's gotten away from me. But my children don't have TikTok or Snapchat, right, kids? Right? Don't embarrass me. You don't have it, right? Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't, and they won't. Uh, but it's we've allowed the digital technology to become the domain of our children so that we don't apply those principles to our kids in those realms. And so our kids then are free to access whatever they want to access, to talk to whoever they want to talk to, uh, out from under the purview of parents. And so parents, uh, hey, this is, I'm out of time and I'm just getting started. So <laughs> I should have started with this at the beginning. Uh, kids, you shouldn't have an Instagram account that your parents don't follow. Especially you girls. I don't think you should have any social media account that your parents don't follow. There shouldn't be any expectation that that's your domain and not your parents' domain. There's no reason. I don't care if technology has advanced. There's no reason for our children to have a social circle or social group out from under the purview of their parents while they're still of age under the roofs of their parents. Uh, we've abdicated that responsibility. For some reason, there's blind spots when it comes to technology, where we allow our children to carry on their own lives and their own social circles, not knowing who they're talking to or when they're talking to them or what they're talking about or what they're posting on social media, uh, and we just let it go. Uh, that's abdicating our responsibility. It's allowing the culture a conduit into the minds and hearts of our children apart from parental authority. It's wrong. Lastly, and it's very, very sad, that I have to truncate it here. But we must provide our children with loving affection. Loving affection. God designed the home with a mom and dad for a reason. Now, there's a reason why God has given uh, daughters a father and given daughters a mother. There's reasons why God has given a son a father and a son a mother. This is God's wise design. Not all of us have the advantage of having a nuclear family with the traditional design. I understand that. Uh, but that doesn't mean being sensitive to those who are in less than ideal situations does not mean we downplay uh, God's ideal in his design, which is the nuclear family, a father and mother. Kids need the tender affection of mom couched in her role as nurturer. Kids need the affection of dad couched in his role as leader. Mom and dad together display the character of God and the love he has for his children. And so in all of this, when we talk about diligent, protect, uh, diligent instruction, we talk about protection and so on, discipline, it's all and always in the context of a very loving, affirming environment. It, it just think of the love of God and His chastening and His discipline. Just as Romans 8 says that I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, so too. Our children should feel that nothing can separate them from the love of mom and dad. But don't veer from the biblical conception of love here. Don't feel that coming down to your child's level and being their friend or being their peer is more loving than establishing rules and authoritative standards that you impose upon your home consistently and diligently teaching uh, the biblical basis for these things, uh, don't have an unbiblical conception of love. Having a loving atmosphere in your home, and I'm talking about words of affection, I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'm talking about um, um, affectionate touch as well, you're hugging and... Um, your um, affectionate, um, multiple areas of your 
uh, home life. Um, you look for opportunities to express your love to your children. You offer to them security and acceptance and confidence. They know where they stand in their relationship with you. Some parents are so manipulative that they kind of turn a cold shoulder to your children, so your children never quite know where they stand in the relationship with mom and dad. And so goes their security, and so goes their sense of acceptance, so goes their sense of confidence. Uh, no, all even discipline is to be done in the context of loving affirmation. So and that's why Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged, a spiritless or disheartened. We must give them loving affection. And we could add to that, and I won't say much here, but faithful intercession, that is, you're praying for your children all throughout that. Now, back to Psalm 127, verse 1 through 5. Psalm 127, verse 1 through 5, where we started. I said that we must provide our children also with faithful intercession. Look in verse 1 now. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go, to, go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. We started by saying in Psalm 127 that verse 3 through 5 give us the proper perspective regarding the family. Children are a heritage from the Lord, a blessing. They are to be molded and shaped and prepared by their parents to engage in spiritual battle. We're to pass the faith on, including principles and values and viewpoints and an entire worldview, and we're to do so unapologetically. And our children are a gift from God. But notice what he says in verse 1. This is Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. In the context here is family life. And it goes on in Psalm 128 to deal with family life. He's saying it's not about your effort alone, however. As much as you may be determined to be a good parent, determined that you're going to teach the right things and you're going to catechize your kids and you're going to have rules in your home and so on, don't trust your efforts unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It's not about your effort alone. It's not even about your discernment alone. It says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. The watchman is the one who's looking for enemies, protecting the city, willing to raise the red flag and to sound the alarm. And we operate that way as parents, as we protect our children and protect our home. But don't trust in your discernment alone, because unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's also no good to give ourselves to anxiety or worry over our parenting. Because, it says, it says there in verse 2, it is in vain that you rise up early and go to late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. And so you're so concerned about your children that you're uh, overcome with anxiety and worry and so on. That's vain as well. And so it's not about our own effort. It's not about our own discernment. It's not about our own anxiety or concern or worry. Why? Because unless the Lord builds, unless the Lord watches, it's all in vain. Now, this is all in vain. Why? Well, it misunderstands the nature of true success. It's not wealth, it's not status, it's not power, it's not fame. It's raising up children uh, that are prepared to engage in spiritual battle that we can leave as a legacy to the world. It also fails to trust God as the builder and protector. But all of this also is in vain because look in verse 2. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. He gives to his beloved sleep. What he's saying is, listen, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Trust in him. You're depending upon him. You're depending upon him being the one who's building the house. You're depending upon the Lord as the one who's watching and so on. You're depending upon him in all of your parenting. Yes, and then what do you do? You just trust. And it says he gives sleep. He gives sleep. And so those who are in the love of God, you can rest. And so don't be overcome with fear and anxiety over your parenting. Oftentimes when you preach a sermon like this, parents go away feeling discouraged, saying, oh man, I'm such a failure as a parent, and I'm failing in this area and that area and so on. So listen, that's, that's, God gives rest. He gives his beloved sleep. Just trust, uh, obey, do what you ought to do, be personal example and, and diligently instruct and protect and so on, but then just rest, trusting that it's the Lord who builds and it's the Lord 
who watches. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Pray you'd help us as parents to rest in you when it comes to our parenting. We understand that you're sovereign. We understand as we look at the world and we see the dangers in the culture, we see the wicked influences, we see the potential for sin and for unfaithfulness and for our children to renounce the faith, we could worry, we become anxious. And then we think it's all our responsibility to do better at uh, teaching, to do better at watching, to do better at protecting, uh, to do better at building. And though it requires our effort, we understand ultimately our responsibility is to keep you at the center. Um, and what we mean by that is keeping you at the center through our all-consuming love for you, loving you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, exemplifying that to our children and encouraging them to do the same. So we pray you'd help us in our homes uh, to have a sincere, genuine faith and also to be able to pass it on to our kids. Uh, we pray that we would not suffer the fate as we saw in Second Kings with the second and third generation forgetting who you are. And help us rather to be able to pass the faith on. So correct us as parents in those areas in which we failed uh, or we are failing and help us to shore up those areas and to do better. Um, and I pray that you give us comfort and give us rest. Help us to understand that it's a matter of trust and dependence upon you ultimately. We thank you for all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.